Good evening, everyone. I think we can give it one more minute until everyone has joined. And then we can Good see. Yeah. Hi, Dorian. Hi. Um, Hi, everyone. Uh, let's wait a bit till a few more people join or we don't at least we'll give them the opportunity yeah usually people keep pouring in until five or ten minutes after the start so but we can start in a minute or so I think we can start. <clears throat> so <clears throat> Johan's gonna do the masterclass for tonight. So I will be quiet for most of it. Of course, I'll ask some questions when relevant and uh, everyone don't be shy to ask, uh, ask the questions or yes. uh, put it in the chat and uh, I will uh, ask them to Johan. So uh, yeah, Johan, take it away. Yes, uh, all right. Well, thank you everyone for being here today. Um, I'll share my screen shortly, but um, the purpose of this masterclass uh, today is for me to present the data sets that we have collected, um, give a few more explanations as to how they are organized and all the things that you can do with it as well. Um, we have performed in our team uh, an exploratory data analysis as well, the data set that I will be presenting uh, shortly for you to give you an idea of what the limitations are surrounding uh, the data that we have collected. And I also want to make a few more things clear because I can see some confusions in some of the groups uh, from what we have noticed uh, from the past meetings, but also from some of the questions that were asked uh, on these Slack channels. And I hope that will all be clear uh, today. And I also want to reserve some time at the end for um, our Q&A and uh, open discussion. Um, between everyone that we can have. All right, so let me uh, share my screen. All right. Um, let's see, I'm not sure which screen you are seeing now. Uh, I think you might the, be. The notes now. And yes, you might be seeing the wrong one indeed. Um, um, you can can display settings above the above CPU. oh yeah yeah all right perfect that's it exactly okay so um well first of all i just want to present myself shortly my name is johan renar uh i'm the cto and co-founder of reef support uh my background is in computer science but i'm now also currently following a uh, master in artificial intelligence at the university of amsterdam and um, as the CTO of Reef Support, I'm in charge of, uh, of the development of the uh, product that we are making, as well as all the uh, development of the, all the uh, artificial intelligence tools, as well as the uh, JS tools that we are currently developing. And so uh, for today, uh, we'll be going through uh, the free data sets that we have collected uh, and we'll dive deeper into the CG data set especially. Um, I'll present uh, and the findings that we have uh, from our exploratory data, then exploratory data analysis from two of the subsets of the CG data sets, which is the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean data sets. We'll compare both. And um, then I'll talk shortly about the objectives that we have in mind uh, for this challenge, make them clearer and talk a bit more about the challenges that you might be facing um, because of the data sets and, and, and such. And at the end, I want to reserve some time for a Q&A and an open discussion. Uh, 
so let's start off with the free data sets. There's the Karma, B, IPF, and C view. Um, but I think you have all seen this already. So the Karma B data set is given us to us by the uh, Karma B Foundation, which is based on the uh, Curacao Island. Um, uh, the data set, the labels are can be found in this file, which is at the root of the folder, which cited raw data Aruba. Uh, on this file, you can find uh, the specific location of the image itself as well as the amount of points per image. So here you can see for this specific image, there's 25 points with the X, Y coordinate of each point and uh, the label name here. So you can ignore the other um, columns I would suggest. And um, the only thing here that is important to note is the amount of total points per image. But uh, I think, yeah, for this data set, it's always 25. And then you have the X, Y coordinate of the specific pixel and the um, label name that is uh, given to that, to that uh, pixel. Um, so for this image, you can see that this is the specific folder name. And if you go to the folder, you can find the image. This one is not that great. It's just a bunch of sand, unfortunately. Um, the second data set uh, is more interesting. It's given to us by the Indonesia Bureau Foundation and what we find more interesting to this data set is the quality of the images themselves, which are far more superior than the two other ones, um, because IBF has a higher standard of how they perform their surveys. Uh, I'm sure that you've all uh, remember um, the masterclass from, from last week with uh, Andre as well, who's uh, the founder of IBF. Um, and if you remember correctly, they do their surveys uh, using uh, these quadrants, which permit them to have a uh, clear, stabilized um, image of uh, of their benthic surface. Um, and the way it is organized is that per um, in those folders, uh, you will find subfolders titled UPT, and in each of these folders, you will find um, the images with the corresponding label, so uh, with the same number. So uh, image one has label ones. And um, the format of the file is CPC because that is the software that they use to label those images, uh, which I believe Marcel presented as well in, during the introduction of this challenge. Um, but if you're curious uh, as to CPC as well, you can also find, find uh, an installation link to the software, um, I believe in the IBF datasets. Uh, this is how a CPC file is organized. It uh, can be a bit more confusing than an Excel uh, file itself, but at the end of the day, it's the same. Um, this number here uh, showcases how many annotation points there are. And then for each annotation point, you will first find um, all the uh, pixel coordinates, so X, Y pixel coordinates. And then for each um, of the label points, you would find uh, what the corresponding label is. This can be a bit more confusing as to how to process this, but um, for each of the labels, you would find what exactly it means uh, in the Coral Reef Health Monitoring Manual Board that is also provided in, um, at the root of the folder. And so for each label, uh, it, so for example, LSP stands for sponge, uh, it's probably somewhere here, but uh, I would go through the manual book to, um, to get a better understanding of this. And then finally, we have the CVU data set. Um, and yeah, the challenge is only two months. You only have two months. Um, so I would recommend for you to specifically focus on uh, the CVU data set as it gives um, access to a better structure and more label, 50 labels uh, uh, in average per, per picture, and also a, a wider distribution and diversity of pictures because it covers not only one region uh, of our ocean, but it has, uh, it's a data set that has been collected by the University of Queensland uh, and that compromises uh, folders for each uh, of our world's oceans. So there's a folder for the Atlantic Ocean, a folder for uh, two different folders for the Indian Ocean, uh, and multiple folders for the Pacific Ocean as well, uh, that is divided for the region. Uh, so this is how the folder is organized itself. So one folder per region. 
And then in your tabular data folder, that's where you're going to find all the labels. Um, you, the uh, most interesting uh, of those files, because there are also other um, uh, annotation files in the tabular data folder, but this is the one that you should refer to, the annotations uh, underscore and then the name of the, uh, the folder. In this case, it's the Antarctic uh, folder. And so for each um, image, there's an ID given and it's corresponding to the ID of the specific image uh, in mind. And then the XY coordinates and the label names um, uh, that is attributed to the pixel. So each pixel has a label name, uh, a corresponding label, but also a functional groups. And what are functional groups? Functional groups are more general uh, categorization of the features. So I want you to specifically remember labels and functional groups, because that is what we have studied uh, during our uh, exploratory data analysis. Um, so now I'll go more in depth uh, into this specific data set. But first of all, to give a definition as to what an EDA is, because I'm not sure if everyone here has a data science background. And some I know some of you are more of a marine background. So just to give you an understanding, it's a method used by data scientists, which is a critical first step before you do anything else with your data set, is to analyze and investigate the data set further. Uh, and to summarize the main findings uh, in order to identify the potential challenges that you may have along the road when developing um, your machine learning model or anything else that you might want to do with your uh, data sets. Uh, so we'll be do we uh, did this um, more particularly our uh, nice team member Nyase who is also uh, listening in now and who I want to give a big thanks for this day, uh, for this exploration. Uh, but this was done for the Atlantic and Pacific Seaview data sets. And um, let's start off with the Atlantic data set. It has about uh, 1,400 images and uh, more than 92,000 labels. Um, so the label names, as you can see, are quite diverse. It goes from fish to really specific uh, type of, of substrates, identifications so for corals. Uh, but functional groups encompass these labels in a more general uh, classification groups. So you have other um, which define all things that are not, uh, well, it's pretty clear, but then you have all gay, hard corals, sponges, uh, other invertebrates, and soft coral. So sponges and other invertebrates encompass the other substrate that you can find underwater, but then uh, you also have it, the differentiation between hard and soft corals. Um, this, these are the top uh, percentage of functional groups and labels that are covered in uh, these files. So what is noticeable here is that uh, for both functional groups and label groups, uh, algae has a big percentage in comparison with the other labels. So the microalgae and the algae matrix as labels um, cover more than 60%, uh, about 60% of the functional groups. Uh, what is also noticeable is that hard coral cover uh, is also larger in percentage than soft corals. And other invertebrates and, um, are also cover a low percentage. And so potential problems that uh, we figured out after performing this EDA is that the amount of label groups is uh, too large. Um, there are over about 67 groups, which means that uh, your model would have to be able to classify 60 different groups, which can be quite um, a hassle. And also for each group, what we have noticed is that there's not enough or there are too many instances for each label group, which might cause uh, your model to be biased towards uh, those label groups that have too many instances. So in this case, 60% of the data set is algae, um, and other invertebrates consist of only 1% of the data set, for example. Uh, but one last thing is that the size of the images in these data sets are, may, might be too large. Um, there are about 1,000 pixels per 1,000 pixels. Uh, but, some, but for example, if, to, if you want to do um, transfer learning on some object segmentation models, they will require an input data of 224 by 224. Um, but I'll, I'll talk more about this later on when we were going to talk about um, 
the objectives of the object segmentation as well as the grow classification groups. Uh, then next up are, is the specific uh, data sets. Uh, this was compromised of uh, 1100 images, a bit less than the previous one, and also uh, a few less labels, 83,000. So the label names, as you can see, are also quite different uh, or actually completely different than the ones in uh, the Atlantic data sets, but the functional groups are the same. One thing that you can notice, though, is that the soft coral group here is missing. Um, if we look at the percentage uh, of presence, um, it is also just like the Atlantic data set where we have a big cover of all gay uh, in comparison with the other um, with the other functional groups and same thing for the label groups. So to give a conclusion as a comparison of these two data sets, um, which are representative of the of the entirety of um, of the eight data sets that are present on the CV folder, is that they're all similar in structure and columns, but the common label the common label names can differ um, in the data sets, and this is due to the fact that these data sets were collected by different organizations around the globe and that they might have used different label names. But at the end of the day, the functional group names are the same. Um, another thing is that large benefit cover of OK uh, with the Atlantic is at 60% and with the data sets is at 58%. So that is a very big number. Um, and also another thing that is noticeable is that the Pacific data set didn't have any instances of soft corals while the uh, Atlantic data set did, but the Pacific data set also has a large density of hard corals, uh, 34% compared to the 10% of the Atlantic data set. So you can see that the two data sets are quite um, contrasting in terms of um, of the uh, organisms that you find in them. Um, but that also uh, allows the model to be trained with different types of pictures because you're dealing with uh, different data sets uh, of uh, different data sets around the globe uh, and also with different organisms. But you do want to be able to train it such that the functional groups uh, are classified properly. So to move on a bit to the objectives uh, that we have in place uh, for all the groups, but also uh, more precisely for each group. Uh, we have in mind um, a specific pipeline at, in the end where a user, um, so coral diver, he'll be able to upload uh, the collected images or videos to our platform uh, titled Refio. And through, through this pipeline, the first layer will be to color correct every single image. Uh, and sort them as well as dis discard the ones that are not of interest uh, by doing the pre-processing of those images. And then um, our AI model will segment the objects, uh, will segment, segment the image in different objects and uh, Coral AI will be able to classify the segmented objects because we don't only want to observe um, the presence of corals, but the main entrance to these uh, divers is to also measure um, the cover of the corals. And to do so, we need to know uh, how much a percentage of the image is covered by the specific coral objects. Um, now, uh, I, I will also open the floor to some questions in mind, and I will talk for each group uh, specifically what we have in mind. Um, so I know for color correction, there was some confusions as well on the Slack channel um, about the data sets as they do not offer um, a representation of what uh, color corrected images are supposed to look like. Um, and I have forwarded um, these questions to uh, um, individuals that might be able to give the specific uh, yeah, Lightroom presets, because that was the, one of the questions that, were, that I received. Um, but to give a clear indication of what we envision uh, with uh, this color correction um, algorithm is that some of the images, if you compare in the uh, CG data set, but also if you look at the Karmabi versus the IBF data sets, 
uh, you can see that the images are quite differing in terms of quality of how it was taken. So for example, um, there are a lot of different factors that can uh, inhibit the quality of an image, such as the uh, speed of the currents, uh, the position itself of the cameraman, so how deep he is or how close he is to the specific corals and how fast he's moving when taking the picture, but also the uh, just the amount of, um, of sand or turbulence in the water itself. Um, and this all has to, to be uh, factored in when performing this color correction algorithm is that um, our hopes is to standardize every single picture that we receive before we process it with our model so that our model uh, has the best possible accuracy uh, for every kind of picture. So what we are hoping for is, um, uh, is to be able to, uh, to clean per se uh, an image so that it looks so that the colors as well as the shapes are more identifiable for the rest of the algorithm. So for the output segmentation algorithm, but also for the coral classification algorithm. Um, this see-through uh, uh, that is mentioned here, that is an algorithm that has been posted. I mean, it, it is uh, something interesting that has been posted, uh, I think two years ago by, um, uh, by this man named Derya Kainak, and he claimed to have developed his own color correction algorithm for underwater images. Unfortunately, he didn't share um, his, his code open sourcely, but uh, I have linked his, his website there if you also want to take a look as, as what exactly his work is. Um, for the rest of the questions concerning the color correction um, part, uh, I have forwarded questions uh, and I do hope to have an answer soon. Um, and also, uh, I will be looking more in depth if I can find a specific data set, uh, but I also recommend that you also look at this yourselves uh, to see if you can find a data set with pre, before and after pictures that are color corrected. Um, but I wanna go back to these, this if there are any questions at the end. But I, I suggest that we first move on to the other groups. Um, so the second group is the outbreak segmentation group. And the main concern here is whether uh, we want to do semantic segmentation or insta segmentation. Um, our purpose for the object segmentation group and why we differentiated to the coral classification group is that um, coral classification does not per se need the objects to be segmented but we prefer to have the object cemented so that we can also measure, uh, uh, offer the coral divers, um, that we can measure the uh, total percentage of cover of those coral images, of the, uh, of the corals on the images. And to do so, we do need to know um, how much of a percentage uh, a specific group covers on the image. And for that, you need segmentation. If you want to look at the difference between semantic and insta segmentation, the main difference is that you're, uh, for insta segmentation, you're also classifying each object that is part of a group. So for semantic, uh, you're only classifying the persons, for example, but then for instance, you're classifying person one to person five here in this case. Um, the main concern uh, that I, I think uh, are based on the data sets that we have, that we have in mind is that if you look at um, if you want to go into label names, there are too many labels to be able to do insta segmentation because then you will be dividing your objects over too many different clusters. Um, but if you just do it on functional groups and if you just divide the insta segmentation on whether it's a hard coral or soft coral or, or um, another substrate, then it is a possibility to do insta segmentation. But I think. Um, I mean, yeah, but um, I said instant segmentation, I meant uh, semantic segmentation. Um, but what I, what, I, what I think should be your main concern here is to just divide um, the images into different objects. And you don't have to worry about any classification or any overlapping within the uh, following group because what they are doing is quite different and I'll showcase it in a second. 
but um, I do want to have a discussion about this because uh, some interesting questions were raised uh, yesterday during uh, the meetings about the data set as well as to how you would have to go uh, do the instant segmentations uh, without any polygons and just the XY coordinate labels. Um, so I want to open the floor as well to this uh, question here afterwards. Um, and for the final group, uh, the crow classification group, um, the, the main goal of the crow classification group is to uh, identify uh, at a functional level whether a crow is, is present and whether it's, it is a hard or a soft coral, um, because that is what can be done with the labels that have been granted to us. And if you manage to do so, you can, of course, go to a deeper level and see if it is possible to uh, label those label names uh, that are quite diverse, as we have seen between the Atlantic and the Pacific data sets, um, and, can, and also are quite different with the other data sets as well. Um, but I would start off with uh, labeling the model, the labeling the um, uh, the organisms within those functional groups, so either uh, sand, uh, other invertebrates, or soft or hard coral. Um, and I also had an interesting question today from uh, Jonas, who asked, "How are we supposed to go about classifying the corals if we don't do uh, segmentation?" Um, well, to answer your question, uh, this is something that also has been shared in one of the papers uh, shared by the Queensland University as well. Uh, and I think this is the perfect way to go about this as well. Uh, and it correlates also with the fact that the images are, are, are too large to be used for transfer learning with already existing models. Um, so as you can see, every image has, has a set of random annotation points and each annotation point has a specific label. So to go about training this, this model, um, you can divide, you can crop each image um, onto different patches, which are 224 by 224 pixels centered around uh, the specific label. So in this case, there, uh, this crop patches, it can be identified as a posilopora, which is a type of uh, hard coral. Um, and that is how I would go about training the model. So with every training, with every label, uh, in the label sets for each image, you can create, um, you should create a pre-processing algorithm that can, that can crop the image and center it around each of the different pixels, uh, which are the, yeah, the label pixels, and then train your model on these patches. And how you would do this uh, finally with the pipeline that has been made with the image segmentation group is that you have, um, well, whether it's semantic segmentation, you have your object that is segmented, and then you, you pick a set of pixels on that object, and you do the same thing for those pixels, you pop it into a patch and you run it for the algorithm, which will give you a, the outputs, um, a set of outputs. It might not be the same for each pixel, but then you can determine for each group, for each segmented group, what the specific, um, uh, what the specific uh, functional group is of that patch. Um, so I hope this gives an indication as to how um, every group correlates to each other, but also how they are different from each other um, and how you can treat each uh, topic as a different challenge. Uh, I also hope I give you a clear understanding of the data set as well, uh, but I'm open to have any, uh, there's a lot of time left and I hope that I can answer all the questions that you might have now, because I'm sure you have plenty, uh, but I also want to open a discussion if there are representatives of the of object segmentation and any coral classification groups, because I know there was quite some confusion as to how um, the two groups should not um, do the same thing. Um, so thank you. That was all for my part for now. Um, I also want to uh, call you all to uh, uh, follow us on our social media. So on our LinkedIn, that's Reefs, Reef Support, and on our Instagram to see uh, what else we are working on and not only our um, 
our AI projects, because uh, we are also doing some interesting projects, uh, such as um, working together with the two Delft to create the first uh, Crow Lab in South Indonesia. Um, thank you very much for your attention, and I'm now open to any questions you might have. I'll stop sharing for now, but if necessary, I'll share my screen again. Thank you, Johan. <clears throat> All right. If anyone has a question, now is the time. Mm, hi, I actually have a question regarding object segmentation part. So as I can see in the data set that we have been provided with the X and Y coordinates of the corresponding labels. Mm -hmm. But in order to like uh, get those bounding boxes, we also need a third parameter like the height of the bounding boxes. So how do we go about this problem? Um, all right, so if I understand correctly, uh, the labels that are provided are not, um, are not enough for what you're envisioning for um, insta segmentation, is that right? Yeah, right. All right, because you're referring to the fact that you also need uh, bounding boxes. Is that around, uh, so you mean bounding boxes around the object itself? Yeah. But aren't, isn't that solving the um, um, object segmentation issue itself if you already have the bounding boxes? Uh, actually, you know, when we have to train the deep learning models, we must have some input parameters like the mask or maybe bounding box. So for the corresponding, as I can see in the data set that we have just been provided with the X and Y coordinates and not with any third parameter, which would help us to, you know, train the model. Mm -hmm. I think you so should be able to find some unsupervised uh, segmentation models that could actually work with just the uh, one pixel where um, where one coral should start. <clears throat> I haven't really dived into this yet, but I, I, I think that those kind of algorithms do exist. Okay, so basically we have to follow unsupervised uh, detection then? I think that is uh, one of the ways that you can go, like uh, as Dorian mentioned. Um, but I'm having trouble understanding why exactly you need the bounding boxes because to me that is uh, a necessity if you're doing um, object detection as well. Um, but maybe you can also pre-run before you're doing any instance segmentation, you can also pre-run already existing models that are out there for object detection. Mm -hmm. um, and that can provide you potentially with the bounding boxes that you need. And you, you can use that in combination with the label sets that have been provided for then um to then make sure that the instances are well uh, detected and um uh, cropped i would say oh. oh yeah thanks a lot yeah that's all i had to ask thank you thank you very much um, um but i also research a bit more uh, on this and i'm sure that your group is doing that as well because i want to make sure that uh, yeah. There is no confusion and that this is achievable, of course. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, I have another, another issue that I might uh, want to address. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, so we have those, um, those labeled images and let's say the cropping this, um, those patches around the points is not a problem then um, I would like to know if the points are like quite centered in the coral colonies or if it could be the case that we have on a labeled image for coral that it's on the edge and it's mostly algae mm -hmm. and we like train the model falsely in that sense. Yeah, so the, mo the, the label points are, are completely randomly generated. Okay. Uh, there are 50 uh, points per image. Uh, so they are quite scattered all over the image. So you might be dealing with the case that some points are really close to the edge of the picture. Uh, and that might be difficult also to create uh, those crop patches that I mentioned uh, beforehand. Uh, but a solution to, to that would be either to 
uh, discard those points or to even try to run the model. And I would suggest that you do this uh, on prior and error and see which, which works out the best um, between the two. Uh, but to answer your question, um, the points are scattered randomly. Okay, so this is something we have to look out for here. Yes, that is a potential challenge that you might be facing there. Cool. Thank you, Leonard, for your question. I, I have one more question. Um, possibly um, I'm thinking too far ahead, but I'm thinking um, obviously in the final, um, mm -hmm. Like the final implementation, the classification model will work with the um, output of the image segmentation group. Um, and I'm assuming, obviously, if like if if the segmentation creates some bounding boxes, we'll have some quite um, random dimensions. Um, and if our if our model is expecting like a certain standardized um, size, like let's say. 224 by 224 pixels. Um, how would we handle the different size of inputs? Would, would, would it just kind of, uh, yeah. Well, I think that would need uh, another, uh, well, no, not some sort of algorithm in between where you're comparing the um, created bounding boxes. So the created boundaries uh, and the set of groups that you created in the image, image segmentation uh, model. Um, that you compare those pixels with uh, the original image, and that, that's how you create your cropped uh, batch that you're gonna uh, use to um, uh, use to infer the output with the classification model. If that makes sense. Um, so that yeah, you're going back to the original image to crop the batch, but you you're doing that with the pixel that has been provided by the um, object segmentation group, and that's how you infer uh, get an answer. But I'm, it might also be a, it might also be just a, a workaround if you just directly off the patch uh, of the segmented object, you get a patch from there, even though you're dealing with maybe some black pixels. Um, that might also be an issue, but I think uh, that might also be a possibility, which is easier, of course, uh, because then you don't have to compare with the original image, but I'm sh I think that might uh, not lead to the best results and going back to the image might do so. Um, but I think this can, it's a discussion that we can also have in the future once you're at that stage. But it's very good that you're thinking so far ahead, Jonas. That's, uh, that's also very important. Hi, uh, this is Ambari Sher. Are you able Hi. to hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear you. Yeah. Yes. So I was thinking, since we have X and Y points, is it like that we take the highest X uh, and the highest Y, lowest X and lowest Y, and then we create the that masking? Since we don't have individual masking and we create the mask, so that's the mask that uh, the first speaker was speaking about, that we don't have a mask. Is that the way that uh, we can do? And so that's because you already have those points all over the place. The mini yeah. points have no value, but the mask is that whole boundary thing. Mm -hmm. Meaning, uh, so the extreme points, if, if I'm not able to explain correctly. So I have my extreme X, extreme Y, X1, Y1, X2, Y2, X3, Y3 and X4, Y4, so that's, is that the way that uh, you're thinking in that way? Uh, because otherwise segmentation, as the first Soham was speaking, yes, I got the name is there, um, you require a bounding box, right? So now mm -hmm. you don't have it, but you've got all the points. So the middle points may not be the ones you're looking. So if we can construct that box, only problem it can happen is that it can cover the whole image. That's the only problem. Mm -hmm. But will it solve the problem? Because once you segment it, uh, what, um, meaning I'm just trying to understand what uh, benefit are we getting that uh, from that, meaning how are you going to use it in the pipeline? Right. Um, 
Well, thank you very much for your observation, first of all. Uh, I want to say that I haven't thought about um, solving the issue in this manner, but that might be uh, a good solution to uh, the problem that um, uh, Soha mentioned. Uh -huh. um, the only thing that I can think of that might cause an issue is like you say that the random points, uh, the points are, are randomly generated and can be scattered in very different manners um, around the picture. Uh -huh. uh, and that you might be dealing with the fact that like you mentioned that uh, some bounding boxes might be uh, covering the whole picture, for, exa for example, uh -huh. or uh, that they might co be covering a large chunk of the picture. Uh, while it's difficult to create bounding boxes when um, when the points are reclustered in one area of the picture. Um, that's the only issue that I see there, but otherwise this mm. might be a potential solution to the problem that Soham mentioned. Um, and uh, sorry, what was your second question about how it, this fits in the pipeline? Yes, yes, how it is fitting in the pipeline, this segmentation and classification? Um, so the purpose of the pipeline is to, um, is to classify the, the segmented objects, uh, the segmented um, objects, yeah, because we want to classify uh, parts of the image uh, to be able to, to tell if, if those, those uh, patches are, are corals or not. Because um, what is of interest to, to these divers and these marine biologists is not just um, whether uh, there is a presence of corals or not on, those, on their pictures, because that, of course, they know, but it's, um, it's the percentage of, of uh, coral cover on those pictures that is more to interest. Because that, with that percentage, you can measure, you can track the growth of your corals as well as the decline. Um, and that is more of interest. So that's how image segmentation and uh, classification go hand in hand together in this pipeline. Um, I hope that answered your question, but I also wanna hear from uh, Soham, if you're still listening in, uh, what yeah. your thoughts are on what uh, Ambarish just mentioned for uh, that might be solving your issue with the burning boxes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Actually, his point is absolutely valid. We can try that out, but as he pointed out that uh, it is a possibility that a single image has like multiple corals. So if we take the min and max approach, as he pointed out, we can land up having the whole image as a bounding box. So that is something we'll have to figure out by the, you know, analyzing the data set. Okay, well, that's great to hear. I suggest that... Yeah. Um, before anything else, uh, like Dorian mentioned as well, you look at already existing models because yeah. that will make your task uh, easier, of mm. course, if you can mm. just okay. use an already existing uh, um, object detect detection model and then fit it to this data set. Uh, but mm -hmm. if that doesn't work out, you can give uh, this a try. Yeah, sure. Sorry, it's uh, it's it's not technically my group, but I'm just curious. Um, you mentioned the possibility of using unsupervised learning for object segmentation, um, and I'm just wondering um, if if we go if they would go for an unsupervised approach. Um, is there any way to evaluate performance apart from directly just kind of looking at the output and seeing how well it did? Um, yeah. Yeah. So that's certainly uh, more difficult to evaluate if you're just dealing with the object segmentation model. Um, but it is possible. This can be evaluated easily once the core classification group is also done with their uh, algorithm, because then you can um, generate a random subset of the pixels that are part of uh, uh, of the segmented groups and use those pixels. Uh, in combination with the coral classification model to see if um, the functional groups that have been detected for each pixel is the same. And then you can see the, the percentage of matching between those groups. Um, but it is, it is the case that it's more difficult to, to uh, uh, measure um, the performance of an unsupervisedly trained 
uh, model directly without uh, using eco classification in this case. I think that what we could do is because we have the X and Y points, mm -hmm. so we could evaluate like after we have the unsupervised boundaries, we could see if the points that are classified as the same thing end up in the same object. Yes. So this would be yeah. like even without the classification. Yes. Yeah. That, that does that does indeed make more sense, Max. Yeah. Uh, but uh, like since the points are not that many, like fifty per, so maybe we could also use the object classification information later. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have also a question because we are talking about bounding boxes. Do we mean like rectangular bounding boxes? Is this going to be good enough or do we want some polygons? Um, I think uh, I think what Soham was mentioning was um, rectangular bounding boxes. And that is also what is achievable with um, Ambarish uh, uh, suggestion. Um, because you're taking the minimum and maximum x y coordinates for each uh, group uh, for each cluster of um, points that are correlated, um, and I yes. Yeah, so that, does that answer your question? Because um, it is difficult, to, I think, to to deal with polygons here. Um, like I think that with the unsupervised approach, we could like estimate like quite finely the boundaries of the objects, like on the pixel level, maybe even. So mm -hmm. maybe it could be better. With the unsupervised approach. Yeah, like I'm not that knowledgeable about this, but I think that's doable to like, that when you detect like the different objects, you detect mm -hmm. like where exactly it is, not just with a mm -hmm. box. Mm -hmm. I think that is uh, that is the purpose of, of, uh, of this group as well. Um, so I do hope that uh, um, that this is the case, of course, because that will make your task easier. Um, so I'm, I'm really curious, uh, particularly how, how that will go uh, upcoming week. So really keep keep all of us posted on Slack as well if you have questions, and because uh, I want to make sure that you don't fall into a, a pitfall or, or you follow the wrong track, because that might lose you a lot of precious time as well. Um, but I, my suggestion is for the object segmentation group to follow. Uh, are are, you, are you, is your group split up in two groups yet or not? If there are anyone for the object segmentation here, because I know that you had some teammates that dropped out. Not yet. Okay. Um, well, in that case, I suggest that you first follow the unsupervised route before you try out um, the generating of bounding boxes. Uh, so, so the solution. Um, so first go the unsupervised route or use an already existing model before you try that because that would definitely cost you more time to process every single coordinate and create a parting box out of it. To, to add to that, because <clears throat> I, do, I do think that a bounding box, like a rectangular bounding box, could, uh, could be enough. So it doesn't, it's not uh, that you're that, that I'm saying that you should not uh, pursue the uh, polygons, but since you're since the classification group will take a small patch within the bounding box, there uh, it's probably already um, yeah not not at the border, so it will already be uh, fully on the coral itself. So for that, I don't think the polygons are necessary, although it might eventually work out better, but. I don't think that's an, an essential necessity. And uh, Ohan, the reason that we are using this segmentation, if we understood correctly, was that the scientists would like to know in the whole coral, how much, mm -hmm. uh, no, in the whole image, how much of it is the coral? Is that the intention? Uh, so from for uh, the intention is that for every picture um, uh, for every picture that they collect or um, in the future videos as well, uh, the intention is to um, get the precise number of uh, of the percentage that the cores are covering uh, on those images. 
so the Benfica the cover is. of the covers, Coros, yeah. Yes, and if yes. you do that with, uh, you can get a rough estimate based on simple uh, pixel labels, and that is what they're doing now, but it's not a precise number. And if you want to move on to uh, speeding up this process and also uh, combining it with uh, computer vision algorithms to do so on videos, then you have to look at um, segmenting objects and the um, detecting the whole patch of coros and not just a simple label. Makes sense. I'm just uh, trying to brainstorm, mm -hmm. like if, if there are say 25 points, right, in an image, say for example, we take a ballpark 25 points per image. Mm -hmm. I don't do object detection at all, object segmentation at all. And I do a regression problem. For me, an image is given and the output is a regression of 25 points. Like a classification, the, we have the classification problem, right? Mm -hmm. So this one, I so, so for every image you've given me 25 points. So for an unknown image, I'll train a model. And for an unknown image, when you give me, you ask, what are the 25 points? So I give you the 25 points. Meaning I've changed the problem definition, if that helps. If I understand correctly, you want the user to uh, also be able to, to justify the 25 points? No, you have already given, for every yeah. image in, in the data set, you have given 25 points, right? X and Y, right? Mm -hmm. So so what I'll do is that when I'll train a model, I'll use those 25 points as a regression. It is a regression problem. And then when you put in an unknown image, I will ask my model, give me the 25 points so that model will give me 25 points. But then you're dealing with the fact that those 25 points, I mean, you could classify those 25 points uh, with the model. Uh, but then you're dealing with the fact that the uh, percent the, the percentage of cover of each uh, of the functional groups, uh, um, yes. there are yes. not enough <laughs> points or so to to detect the precise number. You can have a rough estimate if you do uh, if you divide the percentage of uh, those twenty five points that is uh, that are coros or not, but that is not a precise number of how, what the uh, functional cover is. Mm -hmm. So you cannot treat it, okay. Okay. Hmm. But uh, that is actually a good, a very good observation, and I can see yes. um, how you're thinking about this as well. Yes, I'm thinking it like a face <laughs> face problem, face recognition problem. You ah, have a face. I, yeah. I have on my face. I have say, for example, twenty five points. You give me another face, I will give you another twenty five points. But the assumption that I'm taking all faces are of the same shape. That is, but here in the problem that we are dealing, we don't have that assumption that all corals will have the same shape. So that's why this may not be a great assumption. And so this might not be a great thing to do. Yes, that is very difficult to do with corals because uh -huh. corals really have all shape, shapes and sizes. Uh -huh. um, and that's- uh -huh. So yeah. it, you cannot treat it like a regression problem. Uh -huh. Unfortunately, not. That, that would have made uh, that would have made things easier as well. <laughs> um. All right. Are there any uh, last questions or concerns? Uh, yeah. Well, we one more thing for me. Yes. Uh, like uh, about the color correction, because we probably want to train our models on the color corrected images, because. If everything is just similar color and low quality, it would be mm -hmm. hard to do detection. So uh, when can we expect some uh, results from them? <laughs> is there some <laughs> like uh, um, timeline set for that? Um, well, is there anyone present from the color correction group as well here? Uh, because we estimated um, food bunch and resupport when we talked that the color correction part might take less time than the two other groups and we were hoping for them to achieve it somewhere in the midway three quarter of the challenge but i'm not sure if that is still the case as i seeing the concerns that were raised um for that part as well 
Um, and I can see as well that, uh, I mean, that, that is the hope, of course, that color correcting these images uh, will make the task easier for both the object segmentation and the classification groups. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily rely on that. I would still go for, uh, um, follow what is the best way to segment the objects and uh, classify them with the data that you have now, which is not color corrected before we, we rely on color correction. Um, because at the end of the day, if color correction works out, it will only make the accuracy uh, better. Um, so I would say still, still continue uh, with trying um, the difference. So like, I imagine you're from the object segmentation group based on your previous questions, but um, follow the route that we mentioned beforehand. So unsupervised training and uh, already existing models before you do anything else. And hopefully by then we'll have also some clear indications as to how the color correction group is doing. Uh, we'll keep everyone posted on the main chat uh, as well, but we do have also the uh, weekly month, uh, weekly meetings to, uh, to, to keep you posted about this. But uh, for now, um, I would ignore the color correction group and, and deal with the data set that you have at hand. Thank you for your question, Max. Are there any other last questions? All right. Uh, well, if there are anything, any questions that pop on your mind uh, tonight or in the following days, uh, feel free to send me a message on Slack. Um, if you want, you can also add me on LinkedIn, which is just my name, Johan Renner. Actually, I'm very curious to see uh, where all of your backgrounds are from. So please do add me on LinkedIn. Um, but just if you have questions, uh, ask them directly to me or actually more preferably ask them on the, on the Slack channel so that everyone can see as well. And um, I'm eager to see how every group is going to be doing and, um, and how they're progressing. So I'm very looking forward to uh, next week's meeting. Uh, I want to thank you all for your attention and all the interesting questions that were raised. Uh, and I do hope that this gave you a clearer indication as to how you should proceed. Uh, so thank you, everyone. Thank you, Johan, for the presentation and the masterclass. I think it was very valuable. Um, for me, at least, uh, a lot of uh, questions were answered, and uh, I think for everyone. So... <clears throat> Thank you very much. And then uh, I think we can wish everyone a good night or morning for the people all over the world or afternoon. Who knows? <laughs> yes, of course. All right. Yeah. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Thank you, everyone, for coming Bye. and your attention. Take care and enjoy the rest of the evening or, or the morning, wherever you are. <laughs> Bye. Bye-bye.